friends, my name is Devin Reddy and in this video we'll talk about OWASP Top 10 Proactive Controls. Hold on, we have talked about OWASP Top 10 right in the last video. The thing is, we have talked about the risk, now we are going to talk about how can you make sure that you are writing a secure code. So what are the proactive controls you can take? So here we have Top 10 again by OWASP, so you can go to their website and you can uh, see this list, I will have this link in the description area. Okay, so there are top 10 as, as I mentioned before. So we can, you can see the list on the screen. We have find the security requirement. We have to leverage uh, security frameworks and libraries and blah, blah, blah. There are some 10 points, right? Which are very important. And these are not the only 10 you have to focus on. There are some other uh, parameters as well, which you have to focus, but this is the major one. And they are getting this new increment every few years. So the, the top 10 which we are focusing here is from 2018. Uh, so maybe in next two, one or two years, they will be having some new uh, proactive controls. So now let's focus on this top 10, but not in detail, of course, we, we cannot finish everything in one video, but let's have an overview of all these points here. So let's start with the first one, which is define security requirements. See, the thing is when you work on a project, right? So nowadays, Agile is very famous, right? So we have a culture of Agile, we have a culture of DevOps, where you want to push your code very frequently. So we have a CICD pipeline. If you don't know about these big terms, that's completely fine. Uh, understand this. You don't have to integrate the entire project at the end, right? You'll be having multiple people working on the same project and you will be integrating the code very often. So when I say very often, it's not once in a month or once in a week it is multiple times a day. And that has to be automated, right? And it is happening now in the industry uh, with the help of CICD pipeline, maybe Jenkins. Uh, there are some automated tools available. So using that, you can achieve this. But the thing is, when you look at all these stories, so when I ask what are stories is, the requirements, you can break down your requirements into small chunks and you can call them as stories in the agile world. Uh, so it's not just about following Agile, it's about being Agile, right? So you need to deliver a product in every few weeks and the integration of the code will be very often, multiple times a day. So when you talk about the story, what you do is you combine all the stories and you build one product, right? But then where is security in this life cycle? Of course, even if you talk about one story or one software, you follow SDLC, right? Which is Software Development Life Cycle. Here, we have so many steps, right? We get the requirement, we make the project, and if you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? You have those steps. Where is security in that step? Nowhere, right? You build the entire project, you test the project, and then you think, hey, now let's check the security of this project. That's not how it works, right? It's damn costly, right? Because it is costly to change something after you build the entire project, and it's very costly if someone is attacking your server. That's not a good time to add security features. If you want to make your application secure, you have to start from start, from scratch basically. So the moment you write your first line of code, you have to think about security. And we have talked about that in the earlier video, right? So you have to make sure that you put security stories in your agile board. So basically, if you have 10 requirements of the client, in those 10 requirements, you have to also add the security requirement. But the question would be, from where you will get this requirement? Uh, so this OWASP, they also created something called OWASP ASVS, using which you can get all this requirement list. There's a huge list. And you can check how many requirements you're able to fulfill. You can say, I mean, the requirement mentioned for uh, username passwords, for authorization, the access, everything. You can check those requirements and you can verify if this requirement is covered in your project. The next one is leverage security frameworks and libraries. See, the thing is, when you talk about security, of course, when you talk about software, you need to write everything by yourself, right? You do get some of the features inbuilt from some libraries or frameworks, but what about security? Do we have to code everything by yourself? Of course not, right? You have certain libraries available, you can use them. Uh, so if you want, let, let's say if you want a library for login, we have a library for login, uh, we have a library for rules, assignments, everything. But the only problem is, are those libraries updated? Can you trust those libraries? So you are saying you want to secure the application with the help of external libraries, which are itself not secure. So you have to make sure that you use libraries which are secure and also you have the updated one. So there have been a lot of attacks previously. Uh, they have been using libraries which was not updated. They got attacked and then they realized, hey, something is wrong. 
and then they realize hey, it's not updated. In fact, OWASP themselves provide you some tools. Example, we have OWASP dependency check using which you can check all the dependencies security. The third one is secure database access. Now see, database is actually very critical because all the data, when you talk about attack, the attack is on data, right? It's very precious. So you have to make sure that you secure your data. But how exactly are you going to secure your data? See, the first thing is you need to make sure that you are avoiding SQL injection. Remember, we have talked about one of the most famous attack, which is SQL injection. And the way you can avoid that is with the help of prepared statements in Java. So basically, whenever you create a query, don't just have the inputs directly coming from the user. So you can have a placeholder which will get replaced with the actual values. So maybe you can stop the SQL injection there. But apart from that, it's also about the database, right? So let's say you are avoiding SQL injection, but what about the default configuration of the database? You have to also make sure that you change that. Don't have a default passwords for the data database given by the services. Maybe MySQL have its own default password or Oracle will have its own default passwords change that. And also the way you communicate. So let's say you have your uh, server and your database server on two different machines. The communication between your server and database server should also be encrypted, right? Uh, because if, the, if that is not encrypted and if you have a local machines on that network, someone might be able to hack that, right? So make sure that you have the secure communication between the server and database server. Next one is encode and escape data. So the thing is, one of the attack which we have talked about is XSS, which is cross-site scripting, right? Where attackers send the script on your machine or maybe through servers. Uh, so basically you don't want the script, the JavaScript running on your machine, which is sent by someone else. One of the way you can avoid that is by escaping the characters. See, every time you see a less than symbol, uh, it may be a less than symbol, but then for HTML, it's a tag, right? It's opening tag. Uh, it might be also having JavaScript there. So maybe you can, it's the best way is to use escaping and encoding the outputs. So replace this less than symbol with the alternative, which will be replaced on the HTML page. And the amazing thing is for different languages, we have different libraries available. For Java, we have something different. For PHP, we have something different. Uh, so you can use those libraries to do the escaping. Uh, next one is which is very important, which is validate all the inputs. See, one of the best way a attacker will attack your software or the application is with the help of inputs. The SQL injection happens that way. The command injection happens that way. The DOS attack happens that way. So you have to make sure that whatever input you're receiving from the client is properly sanitized because a attacker might be inputting a data which will affect your system. So whatever data you are receiving on the server side, verify that. And very common way is we do regex, right? Which is regular expression. So what you do, in fact, you, you learn that whenever you learn JavaScript, we learn about how do we validate a email ID? How do we validate a date of birth, right? So email ID, what we check is username. There should be a direct symbol and there should be a domain name, right? We make sure that we don't have a special characters in the email ID. But then if you look at the policies of email ID, uh, the special symbols are allowed, right? But then you have to also make sure that it is not something which will affect the system. Uh, See, so there, there are two ways actually. This is applicable for the access control as well, which we are going to talk later, is allow list and deny list. Something which we used to call whitelist and backlist, but now it is called allow list and a deny list. By default, what we do is we say, hey, a user is not allowed to do this, user is not allowed to do that. The only problem is we are keeping the deny list. Instead of that, you should always use allow list where you specify a user is able to do this and a user can do that. Apart from this, everything is denied. So by default, all the, all the permissions, all the resources, a user should not be able to access that. By default, it should be denied. And then manually, or maybe by specifying some roles or attributes you can mention, what resources can be used by which user that's allowing. Then we have something called implement digital identity. Now we all know, right? Every website nowadays has a username and password. It's been a long time. I've seen a website where you, which don't have this username and password. I'm not sure if Wikipedia has that, but the thing is every website or every application will be having username and passwords. Now that's secure, right? The moment you see a username and password on the website, you feel we are secure because every resource here will be accessed by the users, authorized users, right? But the problem is anyone can hack the passwords, right? There are multiple ways you can 
Maybe you can do brute force attack or there are different ways of atta attacking the passwords. Because most of us, we use the common passwords on different websites or, you know, I have seen some people that are using the website name in the password itself. Maybe if you have a Facebook account, you'll be having Facebook in your password. If you have a LinkedIn account, you'll be having LinkedIn on your password. Uh, don't do that. Every password should be unique. The best way to create a password nowadays is with the help of uh, the suggestions by Google Chrome or whatever password wallet you're using. Uh, so they can suggest you a good cryptographic passwords. Use that. Best way, right? Okay, but then th the thing is, OWASP says there are different levels of security you have to enable. We have level one password, level one where the information is not that critical. I mean, yes, they are critical, but not that much. Maybe your personal information or your current location, those things, not very, not current, lo current location, but something which is not very important, but it is personal. Maybe having username and password makes sense. But what if we want to save data which might affect you financially, personally, maybe your bank account? Here, only username and password should not, will not work. Maybe having a OTP, you know, should be a good option. Multi-factor authentication. Example, if you have a bank account, make sure every time you log in, make sure that it sends you the OTP and then you have to enter that OTP to get the access. But what if you want level three? Now this is where if you have uh, very secret information, something with government, armies, or maybe your personal bank account, which has huge amount of uh, money. Uh, in that case, having level three will be the best option where you will be using cryptographic based authentication to store the data. Uh, something like banks nowadays, every time you don't use your, so let's say if you log into a bank website and if you don't use it for let's say one minute, uh, it will automatically log you out, right? That's the level three type of uh, login you can use. Next is enforce access control, which we've talked about. Every user will be having an access. The only thing is, in the earlier days, we used to do the access control with the help of role-based access control, right? A admin can do this, a user can do this, and we used to hard code it, right? Admin, if the if the role is admin, all the features, if the role is user, all the features. So if I say a user can delete an account, of course, right? a user should be able to delete his own account. The thing is, a user should be able to delete his own account, not others' account. Right, so you have to also mention that. So instead of going for role-based access control, we can also go for attribute-based access control. A user can delete an account, something like that. Okay, so make sure that you mention attributes, not the roles. Of course, you can go for roles, but then don't hard code it. And then one thing we have mentioned before, make sure that it is always denied, not allowed. Next thing is protect data everywhere. Now, the thing is, when you talk about data, we of course, data is important, so we have talked about you have to secure your data on the database side. But what about on the client side? What about the channel which you are using? Uh, so don't use HTTP anymore, okay? Always use HTTPS. Now, some people say HTTPS is slower than HTTP. Uh, that's not the case. HTTPS is still faster. You will not even see the difference. But use that, or maybe TLS, which is a good type of uh, transport security. Now, especially if you talk about the GDPR, every data on the internet is has to be secured. Otherwise you will be in jail, okay? Because GDPR, the privacy thing is very important. So if you have a website and if you are taking users data and if your users are from Europe, the data is very crucial, right? You have to secure it uh, on every level, on database level, network level, every level. So the moment you pass your data from the server to the client, you have to encrypt that. Uh, even passwords, of course you don't store passwords, you store the hash of it, right? But which hashing concept you will be using? There are different caching concepts available here. Uh, you can use MD5 and SHA-1, SHA-2, but they're not that secure. Uh, maybe use something like Bcrypt, which I use. Uh, it's quite good for hashing. The next one is implement security loggings and monitoring. Uh, the thing is, whenever you have an application running, you have to make sure that it is also maintaining logs. And you'll be saying, hey, we do that, right? For every application, we have logs available. Uh, so after every act, you do that system.out.println in Java, or we use some logging things. But then you have to also do a logging for security. Every act, every user. So whatever the activities a user is doing. So if, if something is failing, a user is not able to log in properly with the passwords, log that as well. And that's how you know if someone is trying to attack your website. Having said that, don't log everything. Okay, don't log the personal information. Log only the activities of the user, which will be able, which will be helpful for you to 
monitor later, what type of attack a, user, a website is going through. Because there were some attacks where uh, the website was under attack and it took around two months for the company to understand what is happening. And the last one is handle all errors and exceptions. We know that, we know, we do that. Every time you run maybe a Java application, you have option of exceptions. So you try to handle all the errors, right? All the exceptions. But then we don't normally cover all the exceptions. There might be one or two exceptions which we don't even realize it will arise, right? So in that case, you have to make sure that you check your application, you do code reviews and you check all the possible exceptions. And even if you get an exception, don't do a stack trace. Don't print everything on the console or on the website. Attackers can use that information to attack your system. Maybe a simple error message, uh, this was not found or invalid credentials. Don't say invalid passwords or something like that. Mention invalid credentials or something like that. Don't even say user not found. Okay, so make sure that you handle all the exceptions. So yeah, that's about the uh, proactive controls. I know we were not able to go in detail, but we covered enough to make you understand. So next time when you work on a project or in your current project, you can implement all these features. That's it from this video. I hope you enjoyed. Let me in the comment section and do subscribe for other videos. Bye-bye. Thank you.